Um, <clears throat> Owen asked me to talk about ideas, and I suppose I spent the last 50 years racking my brains to come up with solutions to problems. I guess not hugely important problems like our previous speaker, but um, problems nonetheless. And um, in, in the business in which I work, there's an awful lot of bullshit spoken. <laughs> People talk about um, breaking paradigms and uh, ideation formulas and thinking outside the box. And I think looking back over my particular time, um, most of the ideas that I've had uh, have come from inside the box. The box is bigger than we think, and there's more spaces to look uh, if you try hard enough. And I, I hope I demonstrate in the next 15 minutes or so uh, how these ideas have happened. Um, let hope I get the machine on. I, I, I think a lot of people talking about the better mousetrap um, are looking for something that makes you feel like a more responsible housewife or look like a more responsible human being. Um, in my view, the better mousetrap is about annihilating the little bastards. And um, I think with products, people kind of lose track of the fact that in a product field, what you're trying to do is to make a sale to somebody to say, hey, this product actually is better than the one that went before. And that's been my approach um, throughout my career. Um, I think we should always look for better products in one way or another, not some better psychological insight um, which may change the way people think. Uh, if you've got that, um, I think you're more than 50% there. And working in sort of strangely circumscribed fields like, I mean, how do you come up with a better vodka? If you think about it, law states that vodka has to be odorless, colorless, and tasteless. Now, how on earth do you come up with something um, <laughs> which improves upon that? Well, I tr I've tried a few times. Um, and I'll give you a situation. This is 1990, and the brand was Smirnoff. And Smirnoff was a pretty depressed brand, um, particularly in the U.S. market. You didn't get that kind of perspective in the U.K. And the major influences in the market at the time were Absolute, which is one of the most exciting, sexy, attractive brands, I think, ever in almost any category. The other big influence in the U.S. was... Um, this one, Stolichnaya, authentic Russian Stalinist vodka. And there's Smirnoff, made in Menlo Park, California, selling at about two-thirds of the price of the other two. And we get a brief. Somebody says, well, we actually want to produce a Smirnoff that can compete with those two brands. Now, this is a tough ask, but the, the, the way things worked with the company that uh, employed me was that you could never reject a brief. Every brief that uh, you had to, to follow, even if you thought it was the, a complete load of nonsense. And this was pretty close to that. Anyway, we did it, and it was... Um, the, the brand that emerged was that one called Smirnoff Black. And now, to, um, now go back to looking inside the box. How did the idea happen, and why was it better? Well... The idea started like, like this. It started with a date on the shoulder of the bottle, which is 1818. I looked at that, and ideas, you find them in very funny places, but that's very much inside the box or uh, on the front of the bottle. 1818 was the date when Smirnoff allegedly was founded. Now, the, the, the still that is used to make vodka it's called a continuous still, and it was actually invented by an Irishman called Aeneas Coffee in 1830. Wow. So, if Smirnoff was founded in 1818, it must have been made in something else. In fact, it was made in a pot still, which is the still they use to make um, whiskey and cognac. And this was interesting, so I thought, well, okay, what a good idea. Our first point of contact with Absolute and Stolli is going to be, we're going to be the world's first pot still vodka. Isn't that exciting? 
And I said to somebody, what do you think of the idea of a pot still vodka? And he said, not a lot. So <laughs> that stopped me worried. The point was that pot still vodka is a process. It's not a benefit. So in other words, if I come along to you and say, hey, I've got a vodka that's been distilled 18 times, you might be vaguely impressed, but it doesn't actually convert into anything that's going to make the sale to you. So I had to find a benefit, and I, I took the benefit, and I think it, it, it's all a question of words. If you can find a word, you can create an idea. And the word in this case was smooth, and smooth was a word that had never been used before in the context of vodka. Vod vodka was, was sharp, it was strong, it was pure, it was piercing, but it was never smooth. So we took that word smooth. I got an R&D team to work, and I said, I want you to produce a vodka that is, that, that when people taste it blind, without knowing what it is, they say it tastes smoother than any other vodka that they'd ever tried. And we tested it against Absolute. And Smirnoff produced the world's smoothest vodka. Another story, another, in another category, another time. Where do you find ideas? Strange places. Uh, in a sack. The brief here was to come up with a better gin. The company I worked for, Diageo, owned Bombay Sapphire, but when they merged with Guinness UD, they had to sell the brand because they had too many gins. And the brief from their CEO was, I want another gin on the market within six months, and it has to compete with Bombay Sapphire. So again, I looked this time, um, I, we were sitting on some sacks in the distillery, and they were full of juniper berries, and we were playing around with the juniper berries and doing this and sniffing them. And I said to the head of the distillery, can you produce a gin which is made not of dried juniper berries, not of desiccated juniper berries, but fresh ones? And he said, uh, sure, it cost a bit of money. And we produced Tanqueray 10, which is the world's first fresh botanical gin. Now that's, again, it's a statement, uh, it's a statement, it's not a benefit. The benefit was that it tasted fresher, cleaner, and better than any other gin on the market, and it still does today. Another idea, which came from a date uh, on a plaque in a distillery in um, so what was Soviet Georgia, Tbilisi, we were going around a brandy distillery, and trying to be polite, because going around distilleries is one of the most boring events in the, in the history of man. Um, I had to think of something to say to the guy. And I said, oh, was brandy only discovered in Georgia in 1884? And he said, yes. And I said, well, what did you drink before that? And he said, oh, we drank vodka. But then Georgia's, I think, on the same latitude as Barcelona. So I thought to myself, well, what does the vodka make? There's no grain harvests in Georgia. He said, oh, no. He said, we made it from grapes. And that stuck in my head. We called it chacha, he said. And I thought that was interesting. Uh, I didn't have any use for it at the time. But some years later, 10 years later, I think, we were asked to come up with a vodka to compete with Grey Goose. And... <coughs> From out of the box, I pulled Syrah, which is the world's first vodka made from grapes. So all these ideas are coming from observation. They aren't coming from some kind of magical <laughs> insight or some um, magical technique of uh, generating ideas. Um, another place to find ideas, sometimes uh, the most boring source can yield an idea. Now, this drifted into my office. Well, I'll read it because it keep you all the way. For bottles labelled as varietal, at least 75% must be of that varietal. And that was written in the US wine regulations. And that's the kind of thing that comes across your desk and you think, well, isn't that interesting? And then you start thinking again, so, saying, what about the other 25%? It's a bit like the... the um, Domestov kills 99% of all the known <laughs> germs. You know, what about the, hun the hundredth germ? How bad is that? 
But you can take something as, as dry and as boring as that and create, I think, quite an exciting idea. If you say 75% of the wine must be that varietal. If you take Chardonnay um, and you put 75% Chardonnay, then you blend it with something else, you can produce that, which is red Chardonnay. Now, that, that again is an idea that came from right in the middle of the box, <coughs> incredibly dry, boring piece of legislation, but there was an idea there. How do you turn an absolutely terrible idea into something halfway decent? Um, we got a brief from somebody in Canada, and again, the, the, the rule was you could not turn down a brief, you had to accept it. And this guy, important bloke in the Canadian company, said, I want you to produce a new blueberry drink. And I thought, God, what a dreadful brief that was. But, you know, what an appalling prospect. I mean, to me, blueberries meant dark, sweet, sticky, cheap, and breakfast. How do you turn that into something that's a bit more attractive? Well, I think you have to, if you take that and deconstruct it, you start by saying blueberries don't have to be uh, dark, and they don't have to be sweet, and they don't have to be sticky. You can produce a white spirit out of blueberries. Secondly, you don't actually have to call them blueberries. If they come from Canada, uh, Canada's uh, half French, you could give them a French name, and the French name for blueberries is Merti. I probably don't say it very well. So, you, okay, you've now got a French name for a blueberry product, and um, what we produced was, was that. It's a product called Belmarie. It was a blueberry low-strength vodka. It was a very attractive product, had a very sophisticated taste. And I was thinking, one of the ideas, um, how do you come up with names? Because Belle Marie was a very strange name. And the idea came from there. It was a, it, 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 there's probably no one here old enough to remember. There was a... Well, we do. <laughs> <laughs> you remember it? <laughs> Nelson Eddy and um, Jeanette MacDonald um, and Rosemary. And I thought, Rosemary, Belle Marie, how about that? They liked the idea. The, the idea never really made it, but I think that the, the principle is important, that you can actually take a bad idea and deconstruct it, all working inside the box, and produce something that's halfway decent and halfway acceptable. Um, I think that's, uh, that, that's true. You know, fear, panic... Uh, is, is often quite a, an, an important um, inspirer, I suppose. Um, I used to play cricket, and I had a, an important meeting with a client on a Monday morning. We had a game on the Sunday, and I'd had quite a decent day, so I stayed in the pub until um, <laughs> about half past 11. And the, the, the brief that came in from the client was, what can we do with brandy? We don't own a cognac brand in the company. Is there something we can do with brandy to make it, to give it more status, to give it more, more appeal, to give it more premium value? And I was sitting in my kitchen at about 12 o'clock at night, with a typewriter in front of me, because it was before we had computers, ready to clack away. And what am I going to do? And on the table was, was that, was, a, was actually an empty bottle of um, Bordeaux wine. And I suddenly thought, this is, that triggered off an idea. Um, the best wine in the world comes from Bordeaux. A lot of people recognize that fact. Wine's made from grapes. Brandy is also made from grapes. Gotcha. <laughs> And what happened there was an idea formed, which I thought was extremely credible. Once, well, and once you've got the thought, and again, inside the box, not through any ideation process, um, the next stage was Bordeaux brandy, made in the same neck of the woods as Chateau Lafitte. Uh, that was the bottle. It, it never happened, but I, I think what's important here is the process rather than the uh, the end result. So I, was, I was very chuffed with that particular idea. Um, 
I spent a lot of time doing crosswords. Barbara over there and I uh, argue over crossword puzzles four or five days a week. And it, you get ideas from the weirdest places. Um, we, we were doing, I was doing a crossword, this was, oh, some 25 years ago, desperately looking for an idea, and I found a clue to which the answer was prairie schooner. And uh, I produced a drink called Prairie Dog. But well, Prairie, I, when I looked in the dictionary for Prairie Schooner, I found the, I, I found the type, the term. I then found something called Prairie Oyster. So w w the idea came together. We put dry sherry, we put oyster sauce, we put chilies, we put vegetables into a drink to produce Abercrombie's Prairie Dog, which I was very excited about. Again, it's out of the box. I think, to me, the search for ideas is, um, is 168 hour a week. Whenever you look, um, you can find something, but you have to keep looking. I remember coming up with a brand name for a beer when I got stuck in a traffic jam, and there was a, a German truck in front of me with a whole lot of boxes in it. And one of the, and one of the boxes said, Guns 24 Units, and that became the name for a beer, guns. Um, you just have to keep looking. Uh, here's another one. Um, I sometimes get criticised for watching sport on television, and I say, well, actually, I'm thinking. <laughs> and uh, it's, well, it's, it's incredible. It's a football game. Does anyone recognise that guy? I doubt whether anyone here will. This is 20 years ago. Uh, he was the Belgian goalkeeper. And his name was Jean-Marie Pfaff. And his name appeared the following week on a drink that I developed. I, I just liked the name. I just thought the notion of um, something spelled P-F-A-F-F -F -F didn't sound contrived. It sounded utterly plausible. Again, this is just from looking, looking and looking. Um, I think what a lot of people these days... Um, look to milk a precious brand equ equity for all it's worth. That's the easiest way to develop a new idea. I mean, I didn't want to mention Bailey's, but it was inevitable. I think there have been about 18 different versions of Bailey's since it was launched. So it's very easy. They use the Bailey's name, they use the brand equity, and they do coffee, they do mint, they do all kinds of... I think I, there's a salted caramel Bailey's somewhere. So it's become very popular, and I, I think that kind of approach is interesting. Um, I, mean, I was amazed, really, going back to the 80s, when a guy whose reputation was for sex, drugs, and rock and roll suddenly launched an airline, and, and, and business people flocked to, to go on it. Quite extraordinary, really, the strength of Branson's name and his reputation. I found another one, which is kind of wacky. Um, I think we're all familiar with that brand, and quite recently I discovered that they'd moved into flatulence filtering garments, which uh, <laughs> <laughs> rather surprised me. I, I don't think it's the same company, and I don't think it's an extension of the same brand. So I thought, how the hell did they get away with that? So, um, just a few words to sum up. I think. The, the, the two elements that worked very well for me most of the time, one was sheer panic, and the other one is the desire to impress. Uh, the more important the client, uh, the more higher up the, the company he was, um, the, 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 I think the better the ideas uh, in many cases. Uh, as I said, it's a 168-hour-a-week job. And quite often I would wake up uh, at 3 o'clock in the morning and say, yeah, I think I've solved that problem. Um, I think you have to just keep looking at the information that you have, and I think you have to keep remembering what you know. I mean, that grape vodka idea was 10 years old and we, uh, when we brought it <coughs> to bear on, on, on Ciroc, and that was important. I think you have never stopped looking everywhere. I mean, you could look at a 
poster for an ad and see something there which can impact on something that you're doing. Uh, for, me, it, for me, it was never, ever a team game. I know a lot of people work on things like um, getting together in teams to create ideas. It never, ever worked for me. Uh, I was a lone hand, and I, I think that there are different strokes for different people. Um, I think another important point is to learn to buy ideas as well as sell them. I think people, I, I, this is one of the mantras that I preach all the time, is that the people who buy ideas are probably more important than the people who have them. You know, you can come up with the best idea in the world, but if you take it to somebody and he just simply rejects it, that's the idea's dead. It's not an idea anymore. Uh, the other thing I noticed was that there's a kind of morning after test of ideas. You know, you think about it uh, at night, you wake up the next morning, and you ask yourself the question, is that really going to work? Is that really a good idea? And um, that was quite important for me. So that's my take on a lifetime of uh, really struggling to come up with solutions to all kinds of different problems. Uh, I don't think I could teach people how to have ideas, but I think some of those um, some of those points might be helpful. Uh, I can't help selling the fact that I've done the book, <laughs> and uh, I brought some with me. So if anybody would like to buy one, uh, they'd be more than welcome. But thank you very much indeed for listening.